The Apostle Paul is writing a letter to the Philippians. This is a church that is very special in his heart. Above all the churches that he wrote to, of all the letters that we have, the Philippian church were most dear to the Apostle Paul's heart. There were special people in that congregation. He loved them dearly, and that comes through in the letter. If he could play favorites, he would play favorites. If he could settle in one location, he probably would have settled in Philippi. He would have been around those people that he liked so well. As we look at the book of Philippians, we want to understand what is going on and what Paul is saying that applies to us today. We're going to give some historical background, which is important for us to understand the context, but we're also going to try to bring about some applications so that we understand this letter is not just to the church at Philippi, but it's the church of Jesus Christ of all ages. He's writing to that church, and Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, is inspiring Paul to write those words which apply across the board throughout all time. So when Paul thinks of the Philippian church as dear and precious to him, the Lord is saying to us, you are dear and precious to me in this way. All right, we're looking at Philippians. I'm going to read just the first six verses, and uh, the Lord willing... And the creek doesn't rise. We're going to get through this portion of it tonight as we do an introduction of both the book and of these initial passages. Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 to 6. Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, with the bishops and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine making request for you for you all with joy, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless his word. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, we commit this word to you. We ask that you would give us insights and understanding, and that you would help us to to grow in our love for the Word. And as we see glimpses of truth that are passed to this church, help us to understand that it's for us. And Lord, help us to apply it to our lives and grow. We ask for your anointing. We ask for your understanding in Jesus' name. Amen. I've given you handouts this evening, and I try to do that to keep you awake. And if that doesn't keep you awake... Stand up and turn around three times. I'm going to be giving two parts of the sermon tonight. One is the introduction. Uh, Generally, that will take an entire message and probably will. But then I want to give you the first part of our lessons in Philippians because that's going to apply to our application on Wednesday night as we gather together. We look, first of all, at the introduction. Or what is this book all about? First of all, the city of Philippi. Philippi was a Roman city. It was on the edge of the Roman Empire. It was really considered to be part of the European continent. So as Paul came into Philippi, it was really attributed that was the first invasion of the European part of uh, history. And so all of us that are of European ancestry can thank God that God sent Paul to the Philippian church because they were the first fruits of the Europeans that were converted. The city of Philippi goes back many, many years uh, before the time of Christ. Philip of Macedon, who was the uh, father of Alexander the Great, seized the city in 358 B.C. In 42 B.C., Mark, Anthony, and Octavius defeated Brutus and Cassius. Now, that means nothing to most people. But uh, Brutus and Cassius were those that tried to take over the kingdom that assassinated Julius Caesar. And you remember the, the Shakespearean line, Itu Brute? Okay, that's where this comes in. There. And we have Mark Anthony, uh, who was dating Cleopatra. That whole scenario that surrounds this. So if you looked at it very clearly, if you understood all of the history, this was an important city. As Paul went there, he had these things in mind. This was not just a city of an average Jewish town. This was a Gentile town. A town of renown, a town of responsibility. There were gold mines nearby. Uh, It had a legacy, it had a history, and people that lived in Philippi were Roman citizens. And they acknowledged that, and they were proud of the fact. Paul didn't intend to go to the city of Philippi. That wasn't his original plan. And it's nice for us to understand that even the Apostle Paul, with all the anointing of the Holy Spirit on him, sometimes fumbled the ball. 
He didn't always know God's direction. He didn't have a direct line to heaven where God immediately, vocally spoke to him and said, this is the way, do it my way. Paul sometimes had to feel his way, and that's what it was with this situation. The Apostle Paul is in his second missionary journey. He has already traveled through to certain cities, and as he arrives at this place, he determines in his heart that he wants to go one direction. And he says, I want to go east, uh, or rather, I want to go north. And God says, you're not going north. God blocked the door, and he said, the Holy Spirit did not permit them. And then he says, well, then I'll go south. I'll go the opposite direction. And again, it says, the Holy Spirit stopped him and did not allow him to go south. So Paul sits down and thinks, well, let's see, I just came from the east. I tried to go north. That didn't work. I tried to go south. God says, no. Where else can I go? Well, how about west? And so he takes off to the west, feeling that God wanted him to go that direction. He ends up in the city of Troas, which is Troy. And that's the end of the line. That's as far as he could go. He couldn't go anywhere else, so he just stopped. And and then he said, Lord, where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do from here? He began to seek the Lord for understanding. And it was at that point that God came to him in a dream at night and showed him a man in Macedonia calling over to the Apostle Paul and saying, come over and help us. And the next passage in Acts tells us that Paul assuredly gathered from the Holy Spirit that God wanted them to go into Macedonia. And the key city in Macedonia happened to be Philippi. And so the Apostle Paul ends up coming into Philippi. Now the background for Philippi is found in Acts chapter 16. We read the story of Paul's entrance into that city and what took place. Uh, There are three key people that he found in that city. The first one was Lydia. Lydia was a seller of purple, for whatever that means to them there in that time, that was significant. But Lydia was a uh, proselyte. She had become Jewish by faith and uh, by coming into the Jewish religion. And she was down by the riverside. The commentators indicate that it probably didn't have a synagogue in this city. And so the Jewish people traditionally gathered near a river where there's water so they could do the activities they had to do. And they also had a specific point at which they met. Uh, they didn't have 12 adult males to make a synagogue. And so many of those of that Jewish church were, were uh, just women. The Apostle Paul finds out and he goes to the riverside where Lydia has a prayer meeting going on. And there at the riverside, he strikes up a conversation with Lydia, leads her to Christ, and she's saved. What a wonderful introduction to a missionary to come into a new city. God directs you to riverside to people that are already seeking the Lord, and you open their eyes, and they're wonderfully saved. Lydia takes Paul and his colleagues, Paul and Silas, back to her home, and she puts them up. She's hospitable. She takes care of them. In that process of the Apostle Paul going into the city and begins to preach the word and explain the gospel to people, there is a young maiden called, in the King James, a damsel. And this is indeed a damsel in distress. And this damsel had the spirit of divination. That is, she was a witch, or at least she was a fortune teller and could tell people's fortune. People owned her as a slave, and they used her for their own purposes to get fortunes, uh, tell fortunes and to gain a fortune for themselves. The Apostle Paul is preaching the word and this young lady comes behind everybody yelling and screaming and saying how wonderful these men are. Now, I don't know about you, but as a pastor, I kind of like people to come behind and say to everybody around, this is a great preacher, man, come to our church. And this is what was happening. But this lady was so irritating. This lady was doing it in such an obnoxious way that the, the Apostle Paul initially probably went home and said, man, thank you, Lord, for this loudspeaker. I really appreciate it. But after a few days, it got on his nerves, and he realized this wasn't of God. This was of Satan trying to destroy his work in ministry. And so Paul turns to her, casts out the demons, and the young lady is saved. So the second convert that we recognize in the church of Philippi is a young lady who is delivered from demons. Now remember this. As Paul is writing to the Philippians, he has these people in mind. First of all, Lydia Then this damsel in distress that's delivered from her demons and becomes a believer and puts her faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's interesting to note throughout the gospel, uh, throughout the letters of Paul, how often he emphasizes the ministry of ladies, of women. He doesn't downtrod them, although he seems to in some of his explanations of women's ministry. But his purpose was not to step on women or to belittle them. He raised them up and he said they are good ministers of the gospel. In fact... It is attributed to Lydia that she was from Thyatira and it is she who took the gospel 
from Philippi to Thyatira and planted a church. So you have your first missionary lady in Lydia. The third person we see in the city of Philippi is the Philippian jailer. We don't know his name. We're not given his name. So let's give him a name. Anybody? Anybody? Phil. Okay, Phil the jailer. And Phil the jailer was trying to fill the jail. The Apostle Paul is preaching. He got into trouble with delivering demons from a fortune teller. And what happened was those owners of this lady realized she couldn't tell fortunes anymore. She was spoiled. She was ruined. She couldn't see the future anymore. She could only see Jesus. And so they lost their money and they were angry. So they stirred up the crowd and they got Paul and Silas arrested. They threw them in prison, which was a dungeon. And there in the middle of the night, Paul and Silas are in the dungeon with shackles on their feet and shackles on their hand. I often say they were in stocks and bonds, but then I have people come up afterwards and say, I don't think there was a stock market back then. King James says they were in stocks and bonds, but they were prisoners. They were shackled. What a miserable circumstance. You go into the city and God begins to work. You see people starting to get saved. God is moving in a powerful way and Satan comes against you. Paul and Silas would not be silenced. They said, God put us here. Then I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm going to sing and I'm going to praise the Lord in spite of it all. So right there in the dungeon, they began to sing praises to God to the annoyance of all of the other prisoners or perhaps to the blessing of all of the other prisoners depending on the voice of the Apostle Paul and Silas. As they sang, God sent an earthquake. Remember the story? The earthquake shook the prison, the doors were opened, the shackles fell off, and the jailer, realizing what happens, comes running in, sees the doors open. Evidently, just a, a, a little lamp is, is showing the light. He sees the doors are open. He assumes all the prisoners are gone. He takes the sword, pulls the sword out. He's ready to stab himself. Now, this happens in a moment's time. The Apostle Paul peeks out of his cell, looks out and sees this jailer taking a sword out of the sheath, pulling it up and going to stab himself. And he says, stop! Don't do yourself any harm. We're here. We haven't gone anywhere. And not one prisoner escaped. And so, Phil the jailer takes Paul and Silas and he bathes their wounds and he probably profusely apologized for beating them as he did. And he washes them. He takes them to his own house. And there Paul preaches Christ to him. And there the Philippian jailer, Phil the jailer, comes to know Jesus Christ as his Savior and Lord. The next day, Paul and Silas are released from prison, uh, uh, kind of incognito, like behind the, the scenes. And they say, no, we're not going to leave. Um, you, you arrested us publicly. Now you release us publicly. And finally that was done. And just before they left the city, they went back to Lydia's house. And Lydia took care of them again and sent them on their way. Paul returns to the city of Philippi throughout his ministries on several different occasions. The people of this church had a special place in his heart. They were special people. I'm looking forward to the day that I go to heaven because I'm going to look up these people. Uh, Paul mentions a few people in the book of Philippians whose names are very difficult to say. I'm not going to look them up. I'm going to look up Phil the jailer and the damsel in his dress, and Lydia the seller of purple, and sit down with him and say, tell me the story exactly from your viewpoint. What happened? Fill in between the lines in these stories. The Apostle Paul had the blessing of knowing everything that filled in, the, in between the lines of the story. He knew God's powerful work in the Philippian church. He knew that they were meeting in houses and God was building his church daily. He knew that it was a powerful church filled with the Holy Spirit and God doing extraordinary things. Now, after Paul left Philippi, he went in, uh, on the rest of his journey, ends up in Jerusalem. There he is taken prisoner, made captive. And you remember the, the sailing that he goes and gets shipwrecked and all that other. Ends up on an island. The guy is getting, gets bitten by a viper and Paul heals him, has a ministry there. But eventually he gets another ship. And they end up in Rome. This is Paul's first journey to Rome, his first imprisonment in Rome. It's at this time that he writes several of the letters which are Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. He writes these letters from prison. Now get the context of this prison. This is not the prison like the Philippian jailer had. He wasn't in a dungeon. When Paul went to Rome, he was honored because he was a Roman citizen. He was under citizen's arrest. He was given over to the Praetorian Guard, and the captain of the guard gave him a jailer. 
And the jailer's name happened to be Justice. We know that from, from church history. And, uh, and Justice took care of him. He was literally chained to Justice for the rest of his life or for the rest of the two years that he was there. Now, you can imagine. Can you imagine, please, what it would be like to be chained to somebody else? Well, either you have no bathroom privileges for two years or you go through the humiliation of having somebody with you at all times. That's what Paul went through. But he was given liberty. He was camped out just outside the city where the Praetorian Guard was. He was enabled to rent his own home, which he did, probably from the donation that was given to him by the Philippian church. He rented his own home, and there he received visitors and preached the gospel. The amazing thing is that wherever Paul went, people got saved. And Paul, though he was under house arrest, in his own house, people coming and going, the jailer is first saved, then the other people that are coming get saved, people within the household of Caesar are saved, and all through the Roman kingdom, people are being saved because the Apostle Paul is there. Now, if you were the devil, what would you do with the Apostle Paul? You never thought of being the devil, did you? Well, if I were the devil... I would try to eliminate him. I'd get him beheaded, uh, assassinated, ground up in little pieces, sent to the four corners of the world, something. But get rid of this guy. For two years he's ministering, and the Word of God spreads all through Rome so that at that point, after the two years are done, Paul has a very solid church already planted in Rome, and he's doing this from his own house where he's a prisoner. God did some marvelous things to him. He was in tough straits because as a prisoner, you don't have money and you don't make income. And Paul's books were not selling very well at that time. And so he wasn't getting any royalties from the epistles that he had written. And so he writes uh, letters from prison. People begin to hear that Paul is in the prison. One of the churches that hears early on that Paul is in prison is the Philippian church. They are so concerned and so responsive to the church planter that began their ministry, they send their pastor all the way to Rome to visit Paul in his hired house there as a prisoner. That pastor is Epaphroditus. He sends him, they send him on his way with a gift of money. Imagine this. They don't know how long Paul's going to be a prisoner, but they gather together an offering. They say, here is an offering for a missionary to sustain himself during that period. If he needs more, we'll send more. So the pastor takes off and goes to the 700 miles, whatever it is, to get to Rome and delivers this offering to Paul. In the process of time, Epaphroditus gets sick, so sick that he almost dies. It's evident that the Apostle Paul knows about this. He's very familiar with it. And in the book of Philippians, he's writing to the church to tell them that God had mercy on their pastor. It wasn't just that he got better uh, by natural means or even by, by spiritual means, but a combination. God had mercy on him and raised him up, and he's able to go back to his church. It's an impressive story what God was doing. Remember now, Paul is in his first imprisonment in Rome. It's ten years later that he's arrested again. After he makes his third missionary journey, about which we have very little information, because the book of Acts ends with his imprisonment at, in the first imprisonment in Rome. But we do know from historical sources of the early church that the Apostle Paul was released from prison after two years there. And he was allowed to continue to minister. Historians tell us that he was able to do all the goals that he set down that we have in Scripture. He went to Spain and preached the gospel to the uttermost parts of the earth. From Spain, he was able to come back through and visit all the cities that he in intended to visit. And then in, uh, in 2 Timothy, we read... Uh, the letter of Paul from his second imprisonment, and he talks about what he was, his intentions were uh, before becoming a prisoner, and he said he was planning to uh, winter in the, uh, the city of Nicopolis. It was during that time at Nicopolis that he was arrested, ten years after his first imprisonment. The reason that he was arrested at that time was he was recognized as a leader of the Christians. And Nero had set Rome ablaze and had accused the Christians of doing it. And so they were being rounded up all through the kingdom. The Apostle Paul was arrested in that roundup and brought back to Rome, and this time not in a rented house, but in a dungeon, awaiting his death, from whence he wrote uh, uh, Timothy and Titus. All right, enough of background. Does that give you a good picture of what was happening? 
and puts us in the context of what Paul is all about and his love for the church of Philippi. It was this church of the Philippians that was meaningful to him in his prison ministry those two years, the first time he was a prisoner. All right, now let's look at the book itself. We want to look at the first couple passages because I want to introduce the ideas that the Apostle Paul is communicating to the church. First of all, we see him saying, Paul and Timothy, servants of Jesus Christ, indicating that Timothy was there in Rome with him and was assisting him in his ministry. The Paul, Paul talks about Timothy and himself as bond servants. The first thing I observe in that is Paul wanted the church to know that he had a team ministry. Paul was not a solo minister. He was not out there doing his own thing. He had a team. And he urged people to follow that pattern as the Lord Jesus had urged people to follow that pattern. Jesus sent his disciples out two by two. Paul followed that principle wherever he went. We see in his first missionary journey, he was with Barnabas. But Paul wasn't an easy guy to get along with. He was a know-it-all. He was kind of a dictator. He knew the mind of God, and he said, this is what we're going to do, and uh, this is my opinion, and I'm sticking to it. And so after their first missionary journey, they returned to Jerusalem, gave a report, and they decided, let's go back and visit the churches. And Barnabas said, yeah, let's go back and visit the churches. I'm going to get my uh, my nephew here uh, and bring him along, John Mark. And Paul says, wait a minute, whoa, whoa, whoa. John Mark's not going with me. You see, John Mark had gone on the first missionary journey and failed. He ended up just in the initial months of the journey, arriving at a very difficult place and turning his back. He went back to Jerusalem. Remember who John Mark was. John Mark was a rich kid. He was the son of Mary, who had the room for the upper, uh, the upper room that would seat 120 people. That was a significant room. She was a wealthy to-do person in the church. In the book of Acts, they are meeting in her home for a prayer meeting after Peter is taken prisoner. And John Mark is there. So John Mark is a spoiled brat, and Paul knew it. And Paul says to Barnabas, no, he ain't. He's not going with me. Not while I'm living. And so the scriptures tell us that the, the friction between Paul and Barnabas was so great that they had to decide to split up. Paul could have gone on his own, But instead, he chose Silas to go with him and was ordained by the church to go with Silas and minister. There's something to be said about a team ministry. I feel badly for pastors that are called to pastor a solo church, and I really mean solo pastoring. That the church expects them to do everything, including the mowing of the lawn, the doing of dishes after the suppers, the washing of floors, the cleaning of sanctuaries. I've been there. I know what that's like. And then if you don't do that because you think you're called to ministry, you get scolded by the congregation because you're being proud. Paul said he would not take on ministries without a colleague. In Ecclesiastes 4.9 it says, Two are better than one because they have good reward for their labor. The Apostle Paul knew that. He was trying to pass on some principles to the people of God. He also knew that in prayer, two were better than one. And often Paul was dealing with demon-possessed people. I've also dealt with demon-possessed people, and one of the things you want to avoid is ever doing that alone. You don't want to do it alone. You want to do it with somebody else who can watch your back while you're dealing with demon-possessed people. Paul knew that, and so he and Timothy were working together. And every time you see Paul, he's with somebody else. He's mentoring somebody else. He's passing on to somebody else what he knows so that they can take it and run with it. That's an important principle. Let me ask you a question. You're not a pastor but maybe you're a church leader, or at the very least, you're a godly person, called of God to serve the Lord Jesus Christ as Paul was in your context. Do you have someone who is your colleague, your partner, your buddy in ministry? Or are you doing it alone? I ask that to the elders. I ask that of our deacons. I ask that of our Sunday school teachers. I ask that of every godly leader. Who are you passing the baton to? Who are you mentoring? Who are you training to take your place? You see, Paul said, at any moment, I can go and be with the Lord. For me to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. For me to die is good, he said. But then there are times he said, but it's not good for you that I leave right now because I've got to pass some things along. Let me ask you this. What are you passing along to somebody else? If you were to die this week, 
Is there a heritage that's left behind in this church because of your life? Or have you done a solo ministry? Paul writes to the church and affirms to them again, I'm not alone this time either. I came to you with Silas. Now I'm with Timothy. And we are servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at that second term. He calls himself servants. We lose that in our English. But let's, let's read it the way the Greek, the original language read. It says, Paul and Timothy, slaves of Jesus Christ. He uses the word dolus, which is slave a bond slave, a prisoner slave, one that is on the lowest rank. And he says, I am Paul, the Apostle Paul. But instead of being proud of that fact, he was humble at it. He said, I am the Apostle Paul and my colleague is Timothy and we are bond servants of Jesus Christ. We are chained to Jesus Christ. We are enslaved to Him for the rest of our lives willingly. We're not forced to do this. We love to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And often through the Apostles' letters, you'll find him referring to his ministry and his own commission to the Lord Jesus Christ as a slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. I like that. The Old Testament had a custom that if you were a slave uh, by, for any reason, because you owed a debt or whatever, and found that you loved your master, you could become a slave for life. Now, we think of slavery with the, the black slavery and all the, the horrible things that took place. But in Jewish times... Uh, they didn't always do those things. Sometimes slaves were part of the family and treated very well. And economically, they were doing better than some other folks. And so they could decide to become a part of their master's life and never be able to escape slavery. And all they would do is tell their master, I don't want to be set free. I want to be your servant for the rest of my life. And the servant would take their ear and put it on a board and take an awl and pierce it through and put a ring in that ear. And that symbolized he was a servant for life. That's the terminology that Paul is using here. He said, I'm Paul. I'm a bond slave to Jesus. What a beautiful picture. I think it's a beautiful picture. He's saying, wherever Jesus takes me, I'll go. Whatever he tells me to do, I will do. Whatever Jesus wants, that's what he gets. Because I don't have my own rights any longer. I've given them up. And now Jesus is my Lord and Master of everything. Can you say that? Can you say that about your Christian life? If you were to write a letter to a friend as the Apostle Paul was doing, could you start it by saying, I am, and use your name, and I am a bond slave to Jesus Christ. I have no rights. I have not my own will anymore. I don't do what I want. I do only what pleases the Lord Jesus Christ. Can you say that? What a challenge to our hearts that we could be like the Apostle Paul. And Paul was bold enough in some cases to say to people, do as I do and the Lord will bless you. Walk as I have walked. Let me be an example. You follow in my footsteps. Paul was saying to the people, I am your missionary. I am your church planter. I have been your pastor. And now I ask you to, to be like me. Be a bond slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then we see Paul addressing the saints. He addresses concerning himself, introduces himself as a bond slave of Jesus Christ and a servant of the Lord. Then he says concerning sainthood, he says, um, to all the saints in Christ Jesus which are at Philippi with the bishops and deacons. Now you can read that two ways. You can read it in a rather sinister way where Paul is kind of leaning over with his tongue in cheek and saying, to all the saints in Philippi, ignore the others, and the bishops and deacons. Or all the good people in Philippi, all the good people in the church, and I'm ignoring the rest. But he's not saying that. He is taking the church as a whole, every believer that's in Christ Jesus, and giving them a label. He's saying, you are saints. You are God's people washed in the blood of the Lamb. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. You are God's holy people. You are saints. Now, I'm sure the church didn't have all saints in it, in the way that we think of saints. Everybody did everything right. As a matter of fact, in chapter 4, he scolds two ladies in the church that had a, a difference of opinion. And this is the Apostle Paul who had such a skirmish with Barnabas. He's scolding the church now for two ladies that don't agree on something. And he says, agree together. Agree to disagree, but make amends. Uh, take care of the issue that's, that's causing friction in the church. So there were people that weren't walking close to the Lord, but he calls them saints in the church. 
We've already addressed a few of those people. Lydia, Phil the jailer, and the damsel in distress. And there were many, many others that were saved as Gentiles. They didn't have the heritage of the law, the commandments, so they, they weren't moral people. They were, they were Gentiles living in a Greek culture in a Roman colony. And they were probably just as horrible before Christ as any person could be. And yet Paul writes to them and calls them saints. Saints in Jesus Christ. He addresses also the overseers. That is, every church had overseers. Not just one overseer, but several. Epaphroditus was the pastor, the main overseer of the church. But there were other overseers. That is, overseer meant elders. He's writing to the elders of the church. And he's saying, I'm writing to you guys too. Listen in. And then he writes to the deacons of the church. Now here, let me digress. And we have a few deacons here. Deacons was not a do-nothing job. Deacon ministries were not just taking care of benevolent offerings. Deacon ministries were people ministries, uptight and personal with people, taking care of the widows, taking care of people that had troubles, but taking care of people. We read concerning the seven deacons of the book of Acts chapter 6, and we read that all of them were mighty men filled with the Holy Spirit. They were preachers, they were teachers, they were relating to people, they were building up the body, but they were, even more than elders, people persons who loved people dearly, put their arms around those that were weak, and they carried them. That's what a deacon is. And Paul writes to them saying, I'm not eliminating you. You're not just the benevolent offering people. You're significant ministers in the, the gospel of Christ. Thirdly, we see him talking about his own appreciation for the Philippian church. He addresses them. Uh, he greets them as saints. And then he tells them how much he cares for them. And that's the last part of our message this evening. He says this, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. I always make... Every, mention of you in every prayer of mine with joy, and I'm thankful for your fellowship in the gospel. Those three things. We're going to look at those just briefly here. First of all, he says, I thank God upon every remembrance of you. I want you for a moment to think of somebody that's significant in your Christian life. I want you to choose somebody that's in the church that you appreciate. Is it hard to do? Come up with a name in your mind. Don't shout it out. Do you thank God on every remembrance of those people? Now I want you to choose the person you least like in the church. Oh, my goodness, no. The person you least esteem. The person you least talk to. The person that you don't care for. They're saints in Christ Jesus as well. And Paul says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. I had a kid in high school that, I can't call him a friend, but he was an acquaintance. He was somebody that liked to hang around us, but he had such bad breath. We called him Pukey Palky. His last name was Palky. And the whole junior high called him Pukey Palky. Every time Palky was coming down the hallways, everybody said, watch out, here comes Puke Mouth. And literally, you would stand in front of him, and if he'd start to talk, you would wilt. And you would just cringe and want to get away from him. That happens in the church as well. People with bad breath, B.O., and obnoxious personalities tend to turn us off. And I'm sure there were some in the Philippian church. They're going to be in heaven because of Jesus. Not because of their breath, not because of their B.O., and not because of their, their caustic personalities. They're going to be there because Jesus redeemed them, saved them, made them saints. And so Paul writes to the church and he says, whether you're my favorite friend or whether you're my least favorite friend, every time I think of you, I thank God for you. This sets the framework for the rest of the letter because it's a, it's a letter of a great encouragement to the church to be thankful in everything and to look at the good instead of the bad. And so Paul, looking at the Philippian church, chooses even to look at the least of the saints and the worst of the Christians and say, every time I think of you, I laugh. Every time I think of you, I chuckle to the Lord. Every time I think of you, I thank God for you. The challenge is, can we do that with each other? 
Well, the problem is we don't know each other well enough to even know whether we have bad breath or not. And we need to get to know each other so that we can thank God for each other. But I want to challenge you this week, as you go home and you think about this passage, I want you to ask God to bring to mind some people in this church you don't appreciate too much for many reasons. And maybe it's not their breath. Maybe it's not their B.O. Maybe it's stinky feet. Maybe it's just mm, something happened in the past and you don't like them. And every time you think of them, I don't mean sometimes, but like the Apostle Paul, every time I think of you, I thank God for you. You know, that will transform our church if we begin to think of the least of the saints and begin thanking God every time we think of them. Instead of pushing them out of our minds and saying, I never think of you, bring them to mind and give thanks in everything because there's something good in everything. Paul says this, I remember you, I pray for you, I am confident of you, I long for you. All of these things are part of his thanksgiving to God for every individual in the church. The second thing he says is, I pray for you. I pray for you as you pray for one another. I pray for you. And he goes through the, the whole prayer, and I'm not going to go into that. But the challenge is here, do we pray for our church? Do we pray for one another? As pastor, I get around it a little bit, and I hear talk. People talk. And you know sometimes we talk against people in the church. Don't we? Don't we? If you have never said an evil word about anyone, would you raise your hand? <laughs> and the other liars, would they raise their hands? <laughs> now, as we think of ourselves, we are critical people. We say bad things about people. We put people down. We complain about people. We gripe about the way people are. We look at people in the church that don't volunteer and we complain about that. We look at people that volunteer and we complain about them. We complain about the preaching, it's too long. And if it's too short, we complain that it's too short. If it's too deep, it's too deep for us. And if it's too shallow, it's for immature saints. We're never satisfied. And the Apostle Paul says, stop that. I'm going to give you an example. Every time I think of you, I thank God. But every time I think of you, I also pray for you. I pray for you every time I think of you. And I've tried to make it a custom in my life. When God brings somebody to mind, it's not for me to think bad thoughts about them although sometimes I do and I have to ask the Lord's forgiveness. But my intent is when God brings them to my mind or they come to my mind, I pray for them. Because that's why God's bringing them into your mind so that they can be blessed. Your prayers bless people. In a few weeks, I'm going to be doing a series on blessings and curses and how that works in the church and what are we doing? Blessing. Are we blessing people? Are we cursing people? God wants us to understand that principle. Uh, a few weeks back, I was at council and we were visiting with some of the people that we knew, and we knew a few people there. Uh, one of the ladies was the, uh, the wife of our former president who died of a heart attack, Dr. Paul Bubna's wife. And uh, she had worked in the office where I worked, so I knew her, and I didn't know her intimately because we weren't close friends. But uh, I've prayed consistently for her since that time because she was left with not much money, and I knew that she was going through hard times. And so as we greeted her, uh, the conversation had a lull, and I spoke to her directly, and I said, you know, I have been praying for you, and it's unusual how that comes about. I said, generally, I only think of you when I'm mowing the lawn. And that's true. And I thought of it when I saw her again. I thought, why? Why do I think of her when I'm mowing the lawn? I've never mowed the lawn with her. I've never seen her mow the lawn. I've never seen their house. I don't know what their lawn is like. So, but I said that. I said, I pray for you. And here's when I pray for you. I prayed for you a couple of weeks ago when I was mowing the lawn. You came to mind. And you have frequently when I mow the lawn. And I pray for you because I know it's hard. And she started to cry. And she turned to her friends and she said, you know, that's so wonderful. She says, because the hardest time I've had is mowing the lawn since my husband died. When God brings somebody to mind, it's not to criticize. It's to bless them with prayer. And as you go through the week, would you apply that principle to your life? Paul says, I think of you, I thank God for you, and I pray for you. And finally he says this, and I enjoy the fellowship with you. He uses that word fellowship, koinonia, twice in this passage. 
And he repeats it because he wants them to understand that he considers his fellowship with the Philippian church probably the most intimate fellowship in the body of Christ that he ever had. He said, I really appreciate you. In one passage, he uses the word partnership in King James. Uh, but it's not partnership, it's koinonia, the fellowship with you in the gospel. That is the association and communion I have with you in Christ is special and it's sweet. You remember some of the old songs we used to sing, not the ancient ones, but some of the old uh, songs of the genre of the, the Gaithers. And there's some songs that talk about sweetness of fellowship. And I used to gag on some of that because I don't like real sweet tea. And when the church gets real sweet, I kind of gag too. But Paul is saying to the church, you guys are exceptional. And when I think of you, I think of the fellowship that we had and the fellowship that we continue to have. You sent me a gift. I didn't ask for it. You loved me so much, you sent your pastor, and he almost died. And you were doing that for me because you loved me. And I will be willing to lay down my life for you as well. That's what koinonia is. I would like all of you to take a moment and uh, stand up and look at other people in the sanctuary right now. Just go ahead and do that. It's okay. pastor said you can do it. Stand up, and I want you to look around at faces and people in the congregation. Don't pick one and pick on them, but look generally at those people that are here tonight. Look around. Some are new. Some are, have been around a while. Some are used up. Some are not so used up. But look around, look them in the face, look at their hair, look at the way they dress. Okay, sit down. Simon says, you can sit down. Now with those people in mind, close your eyes. And I'm not going to hit you while you have your eyes closed, so close them. Close your eyes, and those people that you saw, try to bring two or three of them to mind. Put them in a lineup in your mind. And while you're looking at them, let me ask you, have you had fellowship, koinonia, sweet communion with them as individuals? And if not, the Holy Spirit is saying, why not? The church is given that we might meet with one another and encourage one another and impart to each other something of our lives that we would be sweetness to each other. And it rubs off. And so the Apostle Paul summons up all of this, uh, summarizes all of this in this little passage. He says, I love you, Philippians. You're great people. You're imperfect, but you're great. And I look forward to coming back and having fellowship with you. As we enter into days of fellowship on Wednesday nights, I realize not everybody can come out on a Wednesday night. But there is no law that says you can't have fellowship on your own. You don't need the pastor there to do this. But invite a few families over and just seek to establish some communion, some sweet fellowship with people.